Um, my name is Ionuz Lukian. I'm an associated professor of periodontology in the Vigore de Popa University of uh, Medicine and Pharmacy. I'm very happy today to introduce um, a great scientist and also a great friend of mine, Dr. Cheyenne Darvish from the University of British Columbia. He will be lecturing today about evidence-based dentistry, a field in which he has a lot of expertise and also in which he lectured extensively worldwide. I'm very happy that uh, Cheyenne accepted our invitation to take part in the conferences organized with uh, the occasion of celebrating 143 years of um, our university, because um, fortunately or unfortunately, he will be moving in a day and a half in the United States from the University of British Columbia, joining um, the School of Dentistry from Michigan University. And from our knowledge, this is number one ranked school of dentistry in the world. So first of all, congratulations for the achievements. And uh, thank you once again for um, saving some time for us. Also, thank you for the kind understanding uh, in trying to identify a convenient time zone for both of us, because it's quite a gap in between Europe and uh, Canada. So um, let's not um, extend the presentation because the best presentation is the quality of your lecture. So good luck. And thank you once again for accepting our invitation and joining us for this special moment. Thank you, Yunad, for your kind words. Um, hi, everyone. Um, pleasure to be here. Um, it's always a pleasure to um, lecture, and uh, I always enjoy teaching. And um, I hope um, the information I'll provide to you today would help you even a little um, in your practice or future practice. Um, and that will be um, a joy for me if I can help you in any way. And uh, I'm saying hello to you uh, from Vancouver, British Columbia. And uh, this, is, this is the last day I'm going to be a resident here <laughs> for now. Um, and then I'm going to move to University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Um, to begin uh, the next chapter of my life and uh, currently finishing my master's in craniofacial science here at the University of British Columbia. Okay, so um, today I'm going to briefly explain about evidence-based dentistry. Maybe you have heard of it before, uh, maybe you have not, and I'm going to use the slides. Uh, uh, prepared by American Dental Association, ADA, with the permission of ADA. So um, what does EBD or evidence-based dentistry exactly mean? Maybe uh, you will think of science, research, articles, and you are to some level correct and right. It is uh, related to science and articles. But how can it um, be joined in the clinic and clinical practice? So in every clinical practice, the EBD approach is different. We have evidence, we have science and uh, articles, data, uh, which are being produced uh, instantly every day. And we have clinical expertise from the clinicians that are being taught in every different university, different countries. Um, but there's also another circle that we have to pay attention to during our clinical practice, which is the patient needs and preferences. So these three circles are the three main components of the evidence-based um, dentistry. So uh, it is a new approach that was uh, initially introduced um, in 2013, but um, it has been practiced more, lots of comments on it, ups and downs. But today it's uh, kind of a main part of the clinical practice 
at least to the level of my knowledge in North America. So uh, in order to be updated dentists and, and um, maybe a modern method, um, this is something I think that every clinician, especially in the world of dentistry, uh, they have to master it. So if I wanna explain a bit more, uh, I can say that imagine yourself as a dentist practicing in the clinic and uh, you have clinical abilities, clinical skills, you have developed it during the, uh, your clinic, uh, dental school and um, further on with experience of working in different private practice. Um, but uh, there's something you should always pay attention to and that is evidence, that is science which is always helping. And originally it's science that uh, made our textbooks that uh, we're currently putting into practice. Uh, however, these evidences are being updated all the time. And we have to update ourselves in order uh, to be able to provide the latest clinical guidelines for our patients. But there's also, we have to pay attention to our patients' needs and preferences. If I want to set an example, um, let's say you have um, clinical expertise in periodontal treatments, but, uh, and as we all probably should know by now, new perio classifications were introduced lately, um, which that is a new evidence. And so now we have to, when we want to define our perio patient diseases, and identify it or classify it, we have to use that new classification. And then based on that classification, we're gonna provide different treatment options for the patient. Now, in the end, it's the patient needs and preferences that also should take part. We offer as a clinician, the treatment options to the patient from the most relevant to the least, but then, um, we have uh, the patient's autonomy, which is a part of the uh, basic ethical um, parts of the uh, any clinician. And um, they should always consider the patient's autonomy into, um, into considering in the treatment plan. So they have the right to choose. And that's what also we should pay attention to. So um, as a clinician, we have information, we have data, we have to know the statistics and the knowledge, and then that informs us all of that to make a correct judgment and a decision for our patients in terms of defining their, uh, the correct and the most appropriate treatment plan for each individual patient. So, uh, and again, as I'm referring to an appropriate treatment plan, even with the same disease and condition, uh, from one patient to another patient can be different. So uh, to better explain it to you, I want to defer the evidence-based practice, uh, compare it to the traditional practice. Um, the evidence-based, let's start with the traditional actually. Um, so the traditional practice usually has a known basis of evidence because even as I said, from country to country, uh, personal preference, um, the clinical approaches might be different, even different textbooks, and there might be limited or incomplete appraisal of quality of evidence again. And it's subjective. As I said, it's personal preference involved in it. And sometimes it's a black and white conclusion in the end. So in order to avoid these, and unify all the clinical approaches around the world and uh, to update ourselves so that all we should all be on the same page, evidence-based practice is preferred. That is why it uses the best evidence available. So it gets updated, the clinical approaches, the guidelines, they are getting updated instantly with the new data and research coming in. And there are systematic appraisal of the quality of evidence. And uh, it is not subjective anymore. It's objective. It's very obvious. It's transparent. It's for use for everyone in every country, different culture, background, 
different background, study backgrounds, different professors, right? And so um, the acceptance rate kind of like uh, for the patient can uh, be better when we do an evidence-based practice. So when we practice evidence-based dentistry, the clinician will be happier, will be more confident because the clinician is practicing based on a very strong science and evidence backing it up. So you will in the clinic be very confident when practicing it. Your dental team and office and staff will believe in you more, will believe in your practice more. And your patient in the end will benefit more from the evidence, from your abilities, from your clinical skills, from your judgment in order, uh, and, and, and it's really important for your, even, even if you're gonna do a private practice for your business, because you will gain the trust of your patients and that will attract more patients again for you. So it's a win-win for everyone. Now, we talked a lot about evidence, but what is exactly evidence? So evidence has different levels. Uh, it's something that we rely on to make a decision, right? Uh, now, we are not referring to uh, evidence as, as the attorneys do in a court or uh, lawyers do, but um, we are referring to uh, medical evidence or scientific evidence here. And um, I am in this uh, diagram showing to you the three most uh, reliable and uh, strong evidence uh, levels. We further on will we'll continue to lower levels of evidence as well. So at the, top, uh, at the top, we have the clinical practice guidelines. The guidelines are the most reliable level of evidence you can find on any database. When I say database, uh, I mean, we can have different databases. Romania can have a different database. Canada can have a different database. United States can have a different database. But there are some known, uh, well-known, let's say, databases such as American Dental Association, which most of the uh, textbooks and the guidelines um, and the clinical practice, at least here in North America, is relied on American Dental Education Association. ADEA or ADA, even, even um, let's say the pediatric dentistry is APD. It's always the references, um, the American ones usually are, uh, from my experience and to the level of my knowledge, the uh, base reference and a very good database um, to uh, look at. So these guidelines are available on these databases and they're very simple, very straightforward. You can just get to the point. Now, below that, it's the critical summaries of systematic reviews. Now, and again, below that, there are systematic reviews. So in other words, if I want to explain, we have articles publishing, getting published every day, now and often. Now, these articles come together and one or a group of author, authors, uh, they will write a systematic review based on, I don't know, 10, 50, 60 are different articles, and they, they will summarize it into one paper called a systematic review. Now, after that, critical summaries of different systematic reviews will get published. Like these systematic reviews come together and another critical summary uh, of those will come out. Now, in the end, different critical summaries and of course, some uh, meta-analysis uh, which is a very strong statistical uh, method of summarizing the articles or the summaries uh, the, that will be published and these will all lead to a final guideline at top. So when you read a guideline, it's based on years and, uh, and, and years of experience, years of work from different scientists, different parts of the world. It's very... Uh, inclusive and extensive. So these, as, and as I uh, partially ex explained, um, 
Again, the guidelines are a top and the most strong and reliable source. And these systematic reviews um, will go into critical summaries. And there is always back and forth between them. Like, so these all get affected by each other, even when you put it into practice, the guidelines even. So you might face some challenges in the clinic that the guidelines were not strong enough for it. So again, feedbacks come back and go through the scientific and proper way. And these guidelines, critical summaries and everything is instantly they're getting updated. There's the, uh, these are all dynamic. So again, the next question is how do I find the best, uh, the best evidence-based information to guide my practice? And as I said, uh, different databases exist, but ADA is the most reliable based uh, on uh, what I know. Now, ADA, if you go to their website, uh, there's also, uh, it's called Center for Evidence-Based Dentistry. It has like tons of resources. You can look and evidence and uh, look at the guidelines and um, anything almost you need will be available there. But, um, and again, I'm putting some, uh, a picture of some of the guidelines, but um, these have been updated, of course, because the picture is uh, like some of the guidelines are from 2013, but um, these instantly get updated and you can, diff, uh, you can clearly see here when you go on the evidence tab, there is a tab here called guidelines. We have critical summaries. We have systematic reviews. This uh, ADA website only lists the reliable and quality research. Because as we know, even though research get published, we have to always criticize it. We have to always be aware of the quality of the work. So we have systematic reviews, but uh, we have to be aware if it's a good systematic review, uh, whether it has a good quality of systematic review or it was only something to be done and rushed. Or, um, and I'm not trying to devalue any of the scientists or works, everyone's appreciated, but um, not, unfortunately, not all the works that are being published meet the actual uh, standards that they should. So uh, usually critical summaries are around 600 to 800 words. Guidelines are very brief though, very simple, straightforward to the point. Now the next level below it was the critical summaries. And as I said before, they summarize the systematic reviews usually, and they will criticize it. They will say how, like in what way, because usually people who write the systematic reviews also state their opinion on the topic they're reviewing. So then these opinions will also get criticized. And again, clinical implications will get involved, the feedback system. Now, I want to uh, now explain to you lower levels of evidence or primary evidence. These are the evidence or articles or science that make those systematic reviews, critical summaries, and guidelines later on. So these, everything you see here is uh, the level of evidence or reliability is lower than those other three levels of evidence that I previously talked about. Um, so originally, let's say uh, there will be some reports when an issue happens in the clinic or when we're facing challenges, so there are opinions, expert committee reports. Uh, these have the lowest level of evidence. And then based on these reports, case reports, or things that are being published, uh, a non-experimental study like a case control or an in vitro, something like that will be um, like done, a research, uh, which is not usually more than a year, but if it's a cohort, it's different. Cohort studies are, uh, they can be uh, about the future or the past studies. They can come and review even the previous studies. So uh, it's different types of studies, case control, cohort, I'm sure, uh, uh, or you might uh, have studied about it, but these also have uh, one level above, but they're not very 
um, usually reliable. So if you're reading a study about a research question, about a question that came up to your mind during your clinical practice, and, and then you're reading a paper about it, if it's a case control or a cohort, um, you might not want to only rely on that. And you might look into other stronger options uh, if they're available. Now, the next one is the controlled study, but without randomization. So randomization is very, very, very important in, in research, in science, and if we want to do it right, because uh, it helps us in order to uh, have different people involved from different genes, backgrounds, uh, cultures, habits in our studies, because we want to be true. If we focus only on, you know, one population, as an example, the result of our study might be biased. So these studies that are not randomized, they can be biased. I'm not saying they're wrong or uh, they're not true. I'm not even saying they're actually true. They're, the results can be biased. So, but then the most reliable among these are randomized control trials, or sometimes as we heard, clinical trials, depends on if, if clinic is involved in it or not. So it is randomized. We have different genes, populations, everyone involved, and um, it is controlled trial. So it's a randomized controlled trial. And so we are actually uh, doing an intervention. Like as an example, we are introducing a new drug or even the COVID-19 vaccination that was um, first tested before. So there were like little studies that happened first as a clinical trials, randomized clinical trials to see whether the vaccine is actually uh, effective or not. However, these studies, like even the time frame, matters. So even the COVID-19 studies are being continued as um, I am speaking to you. But, you know, the emergency approval was first given by the FDA and uh, Canada's health uh, agency uh, based on these uh, studies. So since we did not have systematic reviews yet, we did not have guidelines for it, um, the FDA and Canada's health, uh, they all relied on lower levels of evidence, which were the randomized clinical trials or even controlled study, sometimes some countries without randomization. So um, these mattered because it was a um, pandemic, right? It was a health emergency. So they relied on this research to make a decision. So how does EBD work? Usually in clinic, we ask, we ask questions like, okay, how can I do this? I faced this challenge while I was working on my patient. Now, how should I, you know, um, approach it? So then you will try to access different sources of data, databases, you try to appraise it, and then you will apply it in your practice. When you apply to your patient in your practice, you should reevaluate. Did it actually work? Did it make sense to me? Did it make sense to my patient? Did it benefit my patient? Did it harm my patient? And then report, feedback. So in order to help you to frame uh, your questions or your research questions, even within your practice, we're gonna practice the PICO uh, method. So P stands for population or problem in a research question. I stands for intervention. C stands for comparison, which is sometimes optional. And, I, and O is uh, the outcome or the result of it. So in order for you to even search better in the databases, it's better to use the PICO method. So if you frame your question in the correct way, it will help you to find the answer quickly. It will uh, increase your chances of finding the correct answer. And that's why, again, we are trying the PICO method. So let's do a practice to understand it better within an example. In patients with periodontal disease, will short-term systematic antibiotics, when compared to surgery, reduce pocket depth? And I'll repeat it again. In patients with periodontal disease, 
will short-term systematic antibiotics, when compared to surgery, reduce pocket depth. So what's the P here? Patients with periodontal disease. In patients with periodontal disease, right? So you had a patient who had period disease. Now, what's your intervention? Short-term systematic antibiotics. So you're considering to put the patient on a short-term antibiotic, right? Uh, like metronidazole, uh, amoxicillin, or uh, anything. So you're thinking about it. But what are the alternatives to it, right? If I don't uh, provide this antibiotics to my patient, what else can I do to benefit the patient's condition, to benefit the periodontal disease? So the comparison, surgery. So you have this research question. Okay, I have a patient with perio disease. Should I go with antibiotics or should I go with surgery, right? Where can I find the answer to that? Who who's going to tell me? What's going to tell me? Which approach is the best approach? In order for what? Like, what am I hoping to achieve? What is the outcome of this treatment? To reduce the pocket depth, which will help the patient to maintain a healthy periodontium, right? So you want to reduce the pocket depth of the patient. You have two different approaches. You want to see, and you have to identify in these situations exactly the population or the problem, uh, the interventions that are available or you're considering, what are the alternatives in your treatment options, and what is the outcome in the end? What am I looking for? So if you identify these, it will extremely help you into, uh, into your search, through the database, through the guidelines, into finding the right evidence uh, in your practice. And as I said, uh, this part or access, is uh, the websites or the uh, uh, databases that you can go through to find the correct answers. So um, as I said, ADA, if you uh, put in your address bar exactly right now, EBD, which stands for evidence-based dentistry, dot ADA dot uh, organization or G, you will go to the American Dental Association uh, EBD and you can find very good resources there, but you can also go to PubMed. And, uh, and as I said, different countries can have different, different databases. These are the most well-known for the uh, finding the right answers. But let's say you had your PICO question, you had your perio patient, you have your question. So you will develop a list of search terms for yourself, like, uh, perio disease, antibiotics, surgery, pocket depth. These will be your keywords for your search, right? You will do your search in these databases. What will you look for first? Of course, we will look for the best and most reliable evidence available, which are the guidelines and the summaries. So the first thing we will try to look on these databases are the guidelines and summaries. Did we find the answer? Yeah, so okay, problem solved. We can go back to our practice, but we didn't find the answer? Okay, we'll go to systematic reviews now, which have a lower level of evidence. And again, in the same databases, did we find the answer? Yes, okay, we'll go, into, go back into our practice. We didn't find the answer? Okay, now we will go to our primary studies. What are our primary studies? The randomized clinical trials first then the non-randomized, then the case control and cohorts. And uh, we don't even have that, okay, then uh, case reports. But we should bear in mind that these levels of evidence, I mean, like I cannot personally only rely on a case report to make a decision for my patient because my patient is my responsibility. I have, I, I have to do the best approach as possible for my patient. To be ethical, to I, I mean, as clinicians, we are responsible for uh, the public health, community safety, and uh, we have to act ethical. So, as I said, when we found found the answer through the databases and PICO question, uh, which helped us to find the right keywords, we will apply it into our practice, 
and we should always assess in the end. So how do we assess? Are the results coming out of this guideline or this clinical approach that we uh, chose previously, are they valid in terms of quality, in terms of quantity and consistency? <clears throat> what is the magnitude effect? What is the certainty of the effect? These are all parts that we sh should think about while we're assessing our results. And in the end, can these results be applied to my patient? In general, as I said, patient uh, autonomy, preference uh, can uh, make a huge difference in your clinical decision. So I read a guideline, you read a guideline, but we might end up going with different treatment options because again, as I said, what's appropriate for my patient might be different from yours based on practicing in different countries, different approaches and different things to consider. In the end, as a clinician, you have the right, you have the full right to choose the uh, best uh, treatment option for the patient with the patient agreement and consent, of course, but always know that you are responsible for it. So what decision you make, be confident with it first. Um, this is another picture I'm putting for you here um, of the EBD uh, series and series on statistics and tutorials where you can um, use for stats for your hypothesis if you're interested into doing um, more, um, to read more about the research and to learn more. Now, in the end, I would like to end my presentation with three nice uh, sayings. The better the research, the more confident the decision, which I, I guess should make sense by now for all. And um, evidence alone is never sufficient to make a clinical decision. As I said, even patient's preference can make a huge difference. And external clinical evidence can inform, but can never replace individual clinical expertise. So your hands-on skills, clinical skills also do play, play a role. These all, as I said, the first three components and circles play a role in the evidence-based practice. So evidence-based practice is not implying that you should only rely on evidence. Always bear that in mind. Thank you for your attention, and uh, I'm open to questions if there are any. Thank you, Cheyenne. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you very well. Perfect. Thank you so much for the lovely presentation, and I guess that... Um, there is a lot of um, discussion regarding the evidence-based dentistry nowadays. And uh, maybe for the residents and for the students, it is very important to clear up some, uh, some basic information in order to know how to guide their practice, as you mentioned, in the future. Because in the end, as you have uh, very nicely said, the patient is our responsibility and there is no perfect recipe in the literature for diseases as we are not treating diseases, but we are treating individuals. Um, thank you once again for the very nice presentation. Tudor will help us join the questions if we will receive them on chats or via email. So maybe if, whenever you settle down in the US, you, you will be able to, you will also be able to answer them. Uh, sure. What I want to share with the audience is that Cheyenne is very humble and he didn't mention that he published uh, a Q1 article last year and I think it's a quite big impact factor. It's a four, no, it's a 7.409. Am I yes, right? Yes, 7, 7 point, yeah. So um, 
obviously he's a scientist that he has the background to and the expertise to talk about evidence based and whenever we are whenever we are uh, hearing all these pieces of information or whenever we are reading papers we have to read them critically because um, as you said in the beginning not everything that is published is necessarily valuable so First of all, we have to identify the strong databases, the mainstream databases, and afterwards, even to identify the weak points of um, certain studies and the weak points in design. Because um, again, even if we are, um, let's say, performing a study, uh, which might have been strong, but we had like a mistake or something that was misleading in the design of the study, the results are not clinically relevant because yeah. in the end, our results should reflect in optimizing future protocols and not being just results because the idea is to improve the quality of uh, healthcare and not just uh, obtain results that in the end are irrelevant. Cheyenne, thank you very much once again for very the welcome. very nice presentation. Um, thank you for supporting our event and we hope that uh, maybe the trip uh, or the road from the US next year will be shorter so you will be able to, <laughs> to join us in person because um, it's much more uh, interesting and much the impact is much more higher and after so long, uh, such a long period of uh, pandemic probably we are, of course we learned how to use this um, softwares which are very useful but face-to-face um, uh, -face interaction is the best at least for science and this is probably evidence-based as well yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay thank you very much if there are any questions please um, please uh, address them if not we will gather them and whenever you have or whenever it is convenient for you we will um Send yeah, them. you're more than uh, welcome to contact me anytime. Okay, thank you so much and uh, best of luck and have a nice uh, trip to the US. Thank you, Yunad. Have a very nice day. You too. Night, thank you. night. Just day for me. <laughs> <laughs> nice night. Yeah, yeah. Cheers. Bye -bye. Cheers.